Okay. Hello and welcome everyone. It is just struck the hour, so we're going to get started. I'm sure some people will continue to roll in, but briefly let me introduce myself. My name is Mariah O'Mara. I am the head of Mia at 100, and uh, I will be joined today by my co-host Pukaraj Ranjan, who if you know anything about 100, you definitely know her. Our <laughs> Uh, we're so happy to have you all with us today, whatever time it, <laughs> whatever time it is for you. We have two wonderful panelists here who are joining us to talk about their inspiring innovation. So with that, first let me introduce a little bit about how this webinar came to be. So um, this past May, we partnered with OpenIDO for their COVID-19 Reimagine Learning Challenge a global call to bring together parents, students, and educators to share ideas, inspirations, and approaches that address the edu educational challenges we are facing amidst the pandemic. The goal of this challenge was to radically reimagine the future of K-12 education in the post-pandemic world. It sought meaningful and relevant answers to the question, how might we help educators, parents, and students adapt to remote, to remote learning while also using this moment to radically reimagine what we need our education systems to be. Hundreds of inspiring innovations were submitted covering a broad range of topics in the education space. Two of these ideas stood out to us here at 100. So since the pandemic began, we have been receiving questions around two key issues. How do we provide quality education for students without access to internet? and how to address the needs of special needs students during the pandemic. So we are so excited to have with us two representatives from organizations working to solve both of these questions. Fakira Nandim, the Managing Director and CEO of Power 99 Foundation, and the Founder and Executive Director of a Global Voice for Autism, Melissa Diamond. So I will talk a little bit more about Melissa and the incredible work that A Global Voice for Autism is doing a little bit later in the session. But for right now, I would like to talk a little bit more about Fakira and what she has been doing. So Fakira Nanjim is more, has more than 17 years of professional experience. She is currently working as the Chief Executive with Power 99 Foundation. She has conceptualized, developed, and is currently implementing the Broad Class Listen to Learn program our Open IDEO Challenge winner for improving literacy, numeracy, and healthy habits in children in public and non-formal schools in Islamabad, KPK, Punjab, Balochistan, and Pakistan. Fakira has produced programs on education, reproductive health, women's entrepreneurship, child protection, child rights, and human rights. By profession, Ms. Fakira is an educationalist who started her career as a primary school teacher with the federal government in Pakistan. She was sent on deputation to the international organization involved in the implementation of interactive teaching and learning programs in public schools in Islamabad, Punjab, and Sindh. She has worked on programs focusing on enhancing the professional skills of public school teachers and university faculty through extensive training. She conducts training of both public and private school teachers of faculty and public universities, including mentor training for the sustainability of the program. So Fakira is going to share her screen with us, and she is going to tell us a little bit more about Broad Class Listen to Learn and the work they have been doing these past months. Okay, thank you so much, Mary, for your kind words. Um, and uh, it's always my, um, you can say, player and my... Um, it's an honor for me to be with the 100 and uh, I just want to share that my experience with the, my journey with 100 started in 2018 when I was in, in Hinsitinki and we were selected as one of the best practice for the presentation. And that was not only an opportunity to go and present our program. I say that I can say that this was the opportunity to change that bring a whole shift in in, in our thinking, our rethinking about the program and to see that how people around the world, they are doing marvelous work for educating children, especially for the marginalized community. So I'm really thankful uh, for, to 100 for providing this opportunity, especially. 
and, and as you have said a lot about uh, me and our organization uh, now i want to uh, share some uh, uh, a, a very short presentation about the program what is the program and how we are responding to covid 19 so i want to share my slides Basically, the name of the program is Prod Class Listen to Learn. And uh, the caption is Parhai Corona. Parhai means let's learn. Uh, corona is let's do it. And uh, and it is it focusing uh, 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 equality, equity, and inclusiveness in education. Next one, sir. No, sir. Uh, as you know that COVID uh, affected children across the world, but in Pakistan, we can say that 46.8 million children going to sc school going children, they were affected by this pandemic. And the data of UNESCO shows that 8.6 million of them are enrolled at pre-primary, 22.9 million at primary, 1.88 at tertiary level and 13.36 at secondary le school levels. And we, we can say that the, this phase of crisis might have immediate impact on children, especially when they, they will not only have losses in their learning, but we are fearing increased dropout rates. And it, especially in the context of Pakistan, we already have 22.5 million children of school of, of uh, five to 11 years of age, they are out of school. So already we have a huge number of children who are all out of school. Our dropout is very high and 51% uh, and, uh, are girls. So we, we, we are fearing that this um, uh, COVID-19 will have immediate and huge impact on the children's education when it will fade out. So, sorry. Uh, Pakistan has taken steps uh, at the state level at, and, and in some instances at the private level for online and distance education. But unfortunately, the, there are various challenges and this uh, uh, COVID has showed a huge divide of have and have not, especially for the technology uh, in the community. So the first challenge is accessibility. The school school year, it is widening the equity gap because many children do not have access to digital devices or internet connectivity at home. Even in far-flung areas, they don't have electricity. So electricity is also a very major challenge for the children who are living in the remote area. Even in, uh, in Islamabad, where I am living, after every two hours, there is one hour electricity shortage. So this is a huge challenge for accessing any kind of technology. The second is affordability. Affordability, you can say that 30% people living below poverty line. And it is very difficult for the low income group to pay cost for internet. Or the, along with internet, they, there is poor lit, uh, technology literacy, which is another problem. Then we can say the connectivity, though we have 4G internet, but the upload is less than one megabytes per second. And at this stage, when most some institutions who are trying to use, because you can say that nowadays, the people, people are relying more on internet. So there is a lot of uh, load on the internet and you cannot get the uh, quality or the, the right, uh, um, you can say, uh, access to that. Another is teachers' institutions' capacity and preparedness. We can say that immediately when there was a COVID and so there was school closure, and we decided that now teacher has to go online. Teachers who who are fearful about the technology or the internet or who don't have any expertise to integrate these uh, digital tools in the curriculum, overnightly they have to become a technology-oriented teachers who are giving lessons through internet. So it was a huge challenge. A challenge. And online teaching resources are not available because most of the teachers, they don't have, um, they cannot afford uh, those gadgets or internet uh, connectivity or uh, other things through which they can connect the children. Another is education institutions do not have expertise to develop content for online teaching. So content for the online teaching was another major issue which teachers and institutions who were trying to uh, do some kind of um, distance learning, that it was a challenge for them. Uh, another thing that I, we can say is social distancing, because we believe that uh, this term in developing countries is not relevant. 
uh, because we are not socially distant, we are physically distant. Because in developing countries, in, we can say in, in the case of Pakistan, we are socially linked, but we are physically distant because all our social platforms were our schools, mosques or gatherings, and they're all closed. So it was another challenge for the children and the parents to cope with this situation. Considering these all challenges, broad class lesson to learn, we introduced Pri Corona, which is interactive radio instruction program. It's an emergency assistant intervention. That's, that would be a stopgap solution for qual equal, equal and quality education for the young children. Along with that, our focus was increased awareness on coronavirus prevention and response through radio programs. So the program addressed specific learning objectives and is composed of series of activities. It has poems, it has games delivered by consistent set of radio characters, including radio teacher, radio student, students who model instructions and activities. And recent, currently we are um, targeting more than 10 million children across Pakistan. The children who are anywhere and they have access to radio, they, we are targeting them. Other than that, we because we are already implementing a broad class listen to program in formal schools, in some madares, in some community centers. So uh, we what we did that based on our initial data, which we, which we already have during the, um, uh, you can say before COVID, we used uh, that data. We, when we started this radio program, we contacted those teachers who are in the community. We have more than 25,000 te teachers who are trained on this program. So we contacted them through mobile phones, through their WhatsApp numbers, through letters, through radio announcements, because uh, these teachers are living in the community. So every community has a representation of teacher. So we con connected them uh, and then we uh, gave them some information. We shared schedules, we shared program design through uh, different mediums. And then we sought their help as a volunteer. And most of the teachers, they come up and they use mobile phone for, or they use uh, radio sets or different tools to, uh, to uh, identify the program and then share it with the children. So this is how we uh, worked on that. We can say that the focus was the most, most critical aspect of health, well-being and cognitive development. So health and hygiene messages, psychosocial well-being and functional literacy and numeracy is the focus of the Power 19 and Foundation during this COVID. We are not only a broadcasting one single program through radio, we have used radio as a whole. So we have, in, uh, st uh, we have designed different programs. Uh, you can say that we have not only uh, newly designed, but we have customized already developed content in response to COVID. Because in our already uh, customized, in our already program, teacher was the main part. But during COVID, children are in isolation. So what we did that we in, we uh, redesigned and customized the instruction, which is targeting individual child wherever he or she is. So the one the first program is Padhai Corona, which is 45 minutes daily programs broadcast daily through radio, and the focus is on literacy and numeracy. These are thematic integrated programs, and in literacy we are we are. Uh, we are integrating all basic subjects for the early graders like science, maths, social studies, English, and neural education. The second component is Radio My Best Friend. This is 20 minutes program. And in this program, we are focusing on culture, art, and music. So it's another program. The third one is live interactive live call-in program in which we, I myself is hosting this program and we invite one uh, education expert or the health uh, uh, specialist. Uh, the focus is on the families because when the parents they are uh, they 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 feel so overwhelmed uh, to uh, because they they there is a shift in their role. Now when the children they are getting these lessons um, through online, parents' uh, role has shifted from uh, to towards the uh, teaching facilitator. So in this program, we are targeting parents or the families or caregivers, any adult who is interacting with the children on different issues like communicating with young, uh, storytelling, or learning through play. Or in some instances, we are uh, dealing with them that uh, how they can help children when they are at home uh, for their uh, to, to, to overcome this uh, all uh, situation. The other is storytelling, which is it is five minutes program, and the focus is on life skills stories. Uh, 
and it has huge response from the children because when children are at home they want to listen stories and the uh, now we want to we are um, we want to do that and we have just initiated that we are collecting student stories that when during covid what what are they doing and what are their stories that they want to share with uh, the other uh, children or with the parents or the community there and all this is done through radio so the our basic tool is radio we are making announcements through radio we're doing programs and we're getting response through live call-ins sms or letters and in some cases cases as i said that we have volunteer teachers in the communities they are also our, our source for getting information from the ground uh, based on all this this is all that we are doing and uh, you can safely say that uh, uh, it has not uh, brought a major shift in the program, but it has also um, become a major program in the country because Minister, Federal Ministry of Education and Professional Training in Pakistan, uh, they have approached us and they want, uh, they, we are working on the possibility of uh, content and replication of this program across Pakistan using National Broadcasting House. The other is Al Arabiya TV, uh, that is from the Qatar. They have also um, uh, highlighted, featured the uh, a story on Prahi Corona program. They went to the field and they captured a story. The program is also featured in Urdu news. M most of the national newspapers or international newspapers, they have also highlighted uh, this program. Uh, and uh, other than that, as you all know that I open IDO and 100 we received a cert certificate it really matters a lot for us because this was the first certificate that we received and then we said no we don't have to do only one program we have to design some other things because there are a lot of people who are uh, who are looking into those things who are appreciating who are encouraging and who are helping us to think more on these lines and uh, at the end I can say these are all our advocacy tools that uh, from where you can access to this program. So this is all that we are doing. Thank you, Fakira. That was incredible. I know we talked about Padhai Corona a few maybe months back when COVID was just starting and already you, in the last two months, things have drastically changed and there's so many more achievements, so many more students under... Uh, you know, been impacted by your program. So congratulations to you and your team for that. Um, one of the questions, like especially what we want to explore in this particular webinar is how, you know, the different innovators, the different educators who are joining and listening, how can they pivot and how can they really reflect on the offering that they provide to their students, especially now that COVID has stopped a lot of the things that we they were doing before right so in your case of course broadcast always had a radio focus but now you're maybe moving you're transitioning from supporting teachers to maybe parents and then really even thinking about how do you capture information from the ground so my question to you would be maybe more specific to the role of say parents or different stakeholders in um as the you know as the pandemic uh, goes away how do you feel different stakeholders can be involved when an innovation or a organization or a school is trying to figure out how to support students uh, thank you, uh, Pagraj. It's a really good question. Basically, um, what we did and from where we learned is a rapid assessment. When there's this situation arise, what we did was, as we were already working on education, we did a rapid assessment, what is the need of the community and uh, how we can integrate with them. So we, I think that that was from where we started. And during that assessment, especially for the parents, because most of the parents, uh, when the, in the context of Pakistan, there was, there is, you can say that for the mainstream students, there, there is nothing. There's only one program provided by the state that is through television. And most of the areas they don't have, they cannot afford TV, there is no electricity or connectivity, or uh, the program is not that instructionally designed program. It was just, just pick and choose, and then it was a content. It was, it doesn't, uh, you can say match to their, exactly match to their school curriculum. So what we have learned through our program is that whenever you work with the children, it has 
to be relevant to their curriculum which they were already teaching in the school so they feel some kind of relevancy and they feel, feel that it no they will get something out of it but my my um, point is that it, during this uh, pandemic and we were not prepared but th though it was a challenge but it was also an opportunity to learn and after when it will fade out uh, we don't have to i don't think that we, there is a need to assess children that how much they have learned we need to assess what skill they have learned and what skill which they cannot which they don't have like uh, especially during this uh, this covid 19 when we were all working on the distance education we have seen that there is a need for self learning and self monitoring of the children which was missing and that was the huge challenge so after that for the parents and the teacher we should focus more on self learning and self monitoring so whenever there is such kind of situation or not children should be able to, or they must possess these skills absolutely and that's a very interesting insight as we kind of also start to think about what next or what the future holds uh, the skill of being able to self assess self control and manage our own learning uh, for young children as well as adults actually is going to be a big learning experience. Um, I will stop now. I know we want to hear from Melissa as well and then we'll pick up some more questions at the end. Okay, but, thank you. Yes. Thank you so much for, for your presentation, Fakira. And now I would, it is my pleasure to introduce Melissa Diamond, a social entrepreneur with a deep commitment to developing cross-border solutions that improve refugee lives she founded and scaled a global voice for autism, a social venture that has equipped over 14,700 individuals in conflict affected areas to support children with autism and developmental disabilities in their classrooms, homes, and communities. Melissa has also consulted for and managed projects at various organizations, including the International Organization for Migration in Cairo, Egypt, the Melissa Network in Athens, Greece, and a healthcare interpretation agency that serves immigrant populations in Minnesota. Melissa holds two master's degrees, her first master's in conflict security and development from the University of Bradford in England, where she was a Rotary Peace Fellow. She also holds a master's of management in global affairs from Tsinghua University in Beijing, China, where she was a Schwarzman Scholar. She earned her bachelor's degree from the University of Richmond in Virginia in interdisciplinary studies. She is an internationally recognized public speaker and has presented on numerous global, global stages, including at the first Global Conflict Congress on Conflict Medicine in Beirut, Lebanon, at Rotary's International Convention in Hamburg, Germany, and two presentations at the United Nations headquarters in New York City for World Autism Day. So with that, Melissa will share her screen and tell us a little bit more about Include 2020, Thank you, Mariah, and thank you to you and Pukhraj and the whole uh, 100 team for organizing this today. So, as, as Mariah mentioned, a Global Voice for Autism works with families of children with autism and developmental disabilities in conflict-affected communities. Um, we've worked in seven countries, and while the majority of the populations we support and the ones that I'll be discussing today are Arabic speaking, um, we've also worked with populations throughout Malaysia, um, as well as populations in the United States, including some extensive work with the Minneapolis Somali refugee community. However, as we started to assess the needs of families who had participated in our program in the pandemic, it quickly became clear that our families who are living as refugees in the Middle East um, as well as Syrian refugees who had since come to the United States had some of the greatest levels of needs. We developed the Include 2020 program in response to a comprehensive needs assessment that we conducted with all families who have taken part in our programs between 2014 and 2018. And 96% of the families we reached out to responded. These results were quite striking. Um, included in the results, 41% of the families were experiencing food insecurity within the first two months of the pandemic. And while prior to the pandemic, 19% experienced an incident of domestic violence in the past six months, that number rose to 39% in the first two months of COVID-19. 
Additionally, when asked about their primary needs, families noted that their electricity was either getting cut off or at risk of being cut off due to inability to pay. And that along with all of these economic needs, 30% of families listed their top need as enrichment and educational support for their child with special needs. It was using this information that a Global Voice for Autism developed the Include 2020 initiative. We realized, like Fakira mentioned, it's very difficult to address education in a vacuum. And if students don't have access to basic needs, whether that's technology or food, learning is going to be quite limited. To do this, we started by creating an emergency fund. We created a confidential system that families could use to apply for emergency support to meet in-kind needs such as food assistance, rent assistance, or electricity payments. We then worked with our local coordinators on the ground in our communities in Turkey, Jordan, and the Palestinian territories to coordinate the distribution of this aid. Um, we had support requests that were fulfilled from families in Turkey, Jordan, and the US. Um, and we also noticed an interesting pattern in that our family is based in Jenin and Ramallah in Palestine, expressed high levels of need, but none of them actually applied for the emergency fund. So as we're preparing to open the second round of the fund, we've been looking into why this is and ensuring that it's also accessible for these families. Our most recent round of in-kind support provided grocery store gift cards to families. And this also allowed the families to offset some other needs. Um, for example, we had a family who requested clothing um, or we had a family who needed assistance with daycare so that the caregiver, the single caregiver, could go to work. Um, and because these, we were not able to send money directly to the families, um, but these needs are still very real, um, we provided the families with gift cards to cover their food needs so that they're then able to shift their income to support these basic needs. Additionally, we created a virtual training and individual consulting program that builds off our normal virtual consulting program during non-COVID times. Um, we have uh, autism professionals as well as special edu educators who work with families on a one-on-one -on -one basis to address emergency needs such as self-injurious behaviors. Um, and 43% of our families saw a new self-injurious behavior from their children during the pandemic as a result of all of the stress and everything that's been happening. Um, as well as on developing communication skills and skills for independence during this time. We also offer group trainings that work to provide culturally appropriate and um, native language training um, in areas that were, receive the highest demands. And so in this case, toilet training, communication, and developing activities with children were the areas that received the most requests. Um, these trainings are all developed in Arabic um, and made accessible to the families. And after they complete the training, they have access to a live Q&A session with the trainer where they can ask any questions and gain more specifics as to how to apply the skills and learnings with their own child. And then finally, the core of our Include 2020 program is a mobile application. And our application employs refugee teachers who have previously been trained by a Global Voice for Autism, many of whom found themselves unemployed during the pandemic as they worked for either humanitarian schools um, or private centers that shut down at this time. Um, and these teachers are creating virtual inclusive education content that caregivers can access to learn how to do different activities with their children. Um, we currently have teachers who are working on videos to support independent living skills, academic skills, foundational skills that help children be prepared to learn, get prepared to learn these things, as well as enrichment activities that families can do with one child or multiple children to keep them engaged during this time. Because we know that internet access is an issue, um, but 97% of respondents had access to an Android phone in the home. Um, we have an application that's available on Android, um, actually launching a couple weeks from now. And um, families can download this application. If they are somewhere that has internet access, they can download the videos and content into the mobile application. And then they can access it offline when they're at home if they don't have internet access. In addition to these videos, um, families take quizzes that show where their child's baseline skills are, 
as well as where their child's skills are and what their user experience was like after they've completed an activity. We also have access to communities within the application, which bring families into various WhatsApp groups, um, as well as Facebook communities, since these are the areas that most of our families can access, and they often have free internet to access these two platforms, so that they can connect with other Arabic-speaking families of children with disabilities around the world and find mutual support around a variety of discussion topics. Um, and additionally, um, many of our families need these additional resources. As I mentioned, uh, food insecurity, domestic violence, um, as well as ensuring that their other children who may not have disabilities have all of their needs met are all primary concerns for our families. And so we've created vetted lists within the communities that we're initially targeting with the app of organizations that are able to partner with us and accept our referrals or that families can access to meet these other needs. Here you can see um, an example of one of our teachers delivering a video um, and he is talking to the caregiver about the skill. Um, and later in the video, he then goes and actually demonstrates how to teach the child. Um, this video is about, um, I believe this, this video is about um, using the bathroom. And so he talks with the child or with the caregiver about how to go about this process and how to break it down. Um, in order to incentivize caregivers to participate, um, they're able, they don't have to pay for the app, but they're able to unlock new videos by completing the quizzes. And this allows us to ensure that we're collecting ongoing data that we can use to enhance the experience, um, see what's working and what's not, um, as well as measure which, which videos are getting the most use. Um, well, I've shown you a mock-up in English today. Um, the entire application is built in Arabic. And as we look at the potential of scaling to different linguistic communities, um, the whole application will be built out in their languages so that they're able to access a tool that's both linguistically and culturally appropriate. And then finally, uh, within the application, if there's a skill or activity that families want to work on that they haven't seen in the app, they're able to submit a request and our teachers will then create that content in response to those needs. Um, so thank you so much for coming, everyone. I'm happy to answer any questions, and uh, please feel free to reach out. Thank you. Thanks, Melissa. That was really incredible. I just want to read a comment that um, is from Shannon Marie Howard. She says, from the parent of a child with autism, I really appreciate everyone's hard work and success. And I think that is definitely a sentiment we want to resonate for you and your team. That's incredible that... Um, in this time, we were able to put this uh, offering out, and I'm sure it's been an incredible journey in the last few months putting all of this together. So congratulations, firstly, um, to you and your team. Thank you. Um, in terms of one question that I have is, um, it's interesting how, you know, you've been able to provide education for special needs, even within limited connectivity. I'm just um, curious to know what are the lessons that you've learned in the past few months of maybe kind of like the do's and don'ts because everyone in our community is one way or the other trying to uh, go online, but they also have this concern of how to support young people um, with limited connectivity. So what, what was your approach? What is your team's approach when you made this uh, idea? If there's some insights and do's and don'ts you want to share. Sure, and that's a great question. Um, a couple of those insights stand out. Um, and the first is that basic needs are educational needs. Um, I see uh, many programs in the same communities in which we're working, not necessarily for children with special needs, but to support educational needs that don't account for the realities that many families are living through at this moment. Um, unemployment rates are unprecedented. Uh, families are navigating childcare in environments where they previously had access to schools and other resources. And on top of this, communities that are traditionally marginalized are some of those that suffer the most. Um, and so uh, my first insight that I'd like to share is that I think it's very important that educational programs don't target education in isolation and that they work to ensure that children have their basic needs met 
and that if caregivers are expected to provide training, that they also have their basic needs met before they're being asked to take on additional educational content. Yes. Um, and the second is that education looks different for everyone. And a child, particularly a child with autism or developmental disabilities, may not have the same educational priorities in this time as other children. Um, and that's okay. Uh, the ch a child who has disabilities, even a child without disabilities, doesn't need to work on meeting their third grade reading metrics right now, just because that's what's been outlined as a regulation. Um, but rather, there are many other ways that children can continue to develop their skills, um, whether that's finding opportunities for social interaction with siblings and caregivers, um, finding ways to engage with content that they hadn't previously, navigating new technology, um, these all provide opportunities for learning that might not look like what that learning looked like in the classroom, but are still equally valuable. Completely. And I think Fakira also talked about this is not the time to pick up knowledge, but maybe the skills that are useful as we, you know, prepare for whatever the world is coming our way. So absolutely. Thank you, Melissa. Um, I know Mariah has some next steps or questions to share and we will potentially now open up the panel. Mariah, do you wanna? Yeah, so first, thank you so much to both of you. This has been so inspiring about the work that you've been doing. And I think we've gotten a lot of questions about how to, both on how to address remote learning online and how to address no access to internet connect connectivity. And it sounds like both of you have done a great job in, in answering those needs. Um, we've gotten a few questions in the chat. Um, one question for, for you, Melissa, was um, how did you roll out the, the program in Palestine? Or did you use the network you already have? Or did you do any other sort of broad marketing tactics? Sure. So in terms of our initial rollout of the program in Palestine, we're focused on families that we have served in the past. And so we have program sites in Jenin, Ramallah, and in Silwad. Um, and we're working to provide ongoing support to those families who have already been with us. Um, most of those families joined between 2014 and 2016 and engage with our network in different capacities since participating in our initial training. However, um, as we do roll out the Inclusive Education app, we're working to get this into the hands of as many families as possible. And so we've been reaching out to various organizations um, that interact with children with special needs in different ways, as well as educational institutions um, to see how we can get this into the hands of more people. Um, and can I ask a question actually very similar to maybe now Fakira. Fakira, one of the questions in the chat by uh, Jurana Aziz is how do you reach out to kids under poverty line? So I know you said that you have teachers in sometimes in the communities and you've been working with them um, to get information back like how what has your process been in reaching out to these students in really marginalized often rural communities across pakistan the first uh, uh, the first uh, you can say the step was uh, relying on our old data and the teachers uh, our partner teachers as we were working with the teachers, so our, our interaction was not only with the teachers, our interaction was with the uh, education officials, education department in the, that areas. And one of the main component of our program was engaging community in classroom school activities. So through that uh, interactions, we have a lot of data available with us of the parents or the elders who are facilitating t uh, children. Other than that, other than that data. What we did that we like in Islamabad, we uh, we uh, approached some churches. So we approached some leaders in the area, and then we uh, and they have there is there are some communities who are li li living in that, and uh, uh, there we get a lot of uh, population because uh, the, the family size is more than five to seven, and mostly they are joint family systems. And even in this situation, most of the children they are living at at the same place. So we relied on those people. We contacted them. Then we share our information. And in some instances, even it was covered. We also distributed radios in that communities. So that was our main uh, source of uh, connecting with the children. And we also used mosques. 
Yeah, no, that's, it's in interesting how um, both of you in different capacities really kind of um, activated the community that you have and activated the network and were able to reach so many children and impact so many lives. So that's incredible. Thank you so much for this kind of the first half of the webinar where you were sharing more about just what the journey has been in the last few months and what you've been able to achieve. And that's also why you were highlighted in the Open IDEO uh, challenge uh, that we did in partnership with them. In the second half, I have a few questions which are more broader, which is more again, because 100 is a network of innovators in education who are interested in supporting young people, helping them thrive. And this has still been our mission despite the pandemic and despite the crisis going on. Um, so we want to learn from both of you how you were able to pivot in this time and what that requires. Um, so the first question for both of you would be, in your opinion, what are the three key attributes every innovator or every educator should have when you're hit with a crisis? And this could be a pandemic or something local, regional, but what would be the three key attributes for an innovator to have this sort of flexibility to adapt? I think uh, the first uh, and the foremost is, as I earlier said, rapid assessment of the need of the community and what we already have in our, um, in our box. And the second thing that we think that is very important is decision making. So in, in these kind of situations, you have to be quick in making decisions and to evaluating all those things. And most importantly, leadership. So who can take the risk or who can take the thing, things? Uh, and when we say leadership, it's not only one person, along with leadership, the team. So I think these were the three main things that helped us a lot to face this challenge and to come forward as one of the, um, you can say, a successful program, especially during COVID. Thanks, Mathira. Melissa, what would you say? So um, a number of my points overlap with Fakira's points as well. Um, I would say the first is flexibility. And for a Global Voice for Autism, we work in conflict-affected communities. And so every day we have to be flexible and be ready to adjust to circumstances. We once had to evacuate a program site due to political unrest with less than 48 hours notice, and we're able to put the whole program online during that time. And um, one thing that our team has learned from that experience is that in addition to the importance of flexibility, um, staying creative during these times can also turn these challenges into opportunities and provide ways to think about these problems um, and the challenges that the communities face in ways that we've never had to and never had the opportunity to previously. And then finally, um, I think something that's really important during these times is to respond to the community first. Um, particularly during COVID-19, many grant-making organizations, for example, pivoted to provide a COVID response. And for a number of our partner organizations, their focus has been, understandably, on adapting their programs to get the funds that they need to survive. Um, and while, um, while we definitely do need the funds in order to operate, we took a different approach. We first went to the community, said, what do you need? And then sought to find a way to support those community needs. Because if we're providing programs that aren't meeting the community's actual need, we haven't created that impact and we're not a step closer to our goal. I don't know if Mariah actually picked you guys because you have such similar approaches or what, but it's really interesting that very different contexts and very different realities, but both of you talked about really understanding the community needs, doing that rapid assessment, and then taking that stakeholder voice really closely to the intervention that is being planned. And I think that is definitely a very useful insight for our innovator communities who are mostly kind of just reacting um, with the pandemic. So just to kind of ground ourselves back into the child's needs, our community's needs is really, um, thank you for like kind of both of you reiterating that. Um, a kind of connected question would be, how do you then involve the various stakeholders in the decision-making process? And at the same time, like make them feel heard and valued during this uncertain time? Because as you said there, even Melissa, for your uh, teachers, you said many of them have been unemployed because of the pandemic. 
and still they're able to offer their services and their expertise. So how do you bring these different stakeholders together and um, kind of make them part of the process? So uh, for us at A Global Voice for Autism, we're very lucky in this sense, in that we've been developing a community since 2014. And that community has really, they've had the networks that already exist to support one another, um, and then have been able to use them to come together during this time. And so, for example, we have WhatsApp groups with the teachers, um, and we communicate with them on at least a weekly basis. Now it's multiple times a day during the pandemic. Um, but we're able to go to them and discuss ideas and get their ideas. This actually, um, the Include 2020 mobile app actually originated um, from one of, the, uh, one of our teachers, Rana, uh, who came up with the idea that she wanted to teach other families outside of her community where she was living in Turkey um, and saw this as a way to do so. Um, and so using those networks we've developed, We've had them do additional outreach to organizations in their communities that support similar populations so that we can also bring them in and provide support using the, through these services. Agita, would you like to add something? Yes, um, same that we have WhatsApp group, uh, teachers WhatsApp group, which was the main source. Other than that, we also relied on parents, uh, teacher councils because we were working on them and we used that groups also. And um, very importantly, local and Pakistan, uh, and they have different platforms and different groups. So we 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 worked with them also and. Um, at, the, at especially during this case because everyone was same uh, situation so they want to contribute something or they want to be part of uh, this kind any kind of program which is uh, directly reaching out to children so we we receive a lot of uh, support from them too absolutely interesting um i would actually at this point maybe encourage the um, all the participants who are here to ask some questions and like leave in the chat or the Q&A poll. I will now start taking some community questions. Um, so Mariah, do you have something? I do, I have one question while you, uh, while you look at the, the questions from the chat. Uh, my question is for both of you. And you know, you both talked about the importance of community and how you have such a strong community. Do you have any advice for sort of younger innovators who are trying to build that community? Melissa, I know that you have such a broad range and you're in many different places that are probably hard to get a foot in in the door. So do you have any any advice for, for other innovators who, who want to help and have these great ideas but don't yet have the community? Uh -huh. that's, that's a great question, Mariah. Thank you. And um, I have a lot of thoughts on this, but one thing that I want to emphasize is um, oftentimes when I see people looking at networking, um, our focus or what we're encouraged to do is network up, to find the CEOs of organizations or to find people who have power within the community and get them to throw their support behind a particular action. Um, I've actually found that my most valuable networking um, as we've worked to create change through a Global Voice for Autism's programs has not been with people who are in positions of power, but people who are really at the local level in their community and who maybe haven't done something yet, but want to do something and are just as motivated as the person with the idea. Um, and some of our most powerful and fruitful connections through a Global Voice for Autism have come from just building relationships with peers in the community or students in the community um, who are motivated, want to make this happen, um, and haven't done so yet, but because they're so motivated, we'll find a way to do it. Um, and so I would encourage people to think about, think about power and think about who is a valuable connection a bit differently and look at people who share the passion rather than who have the power. Um, I want to add that um, we, I believe that in the program design for the new innovator suggestion is that in the program design, we have to include community component as most important component. So when it's your program design, then it's easy for you to uh, to interact with them. Most 
quickly. We have a program, we involve uh, community during awareness only, or uh, just to tell them that what we are doing. So if they are in the program design, then there will be some activity which, we'll be doing, which we will be doing directly with them. In our case, as our program is publicly broadcast, so everybody, even parents at home, at work, or all stakeholders were able to listen. So we not only broadcast the program, we invite them to be part of this program in any capacity. If they have some skills, they can come. Like we we found most of the parents who are or grandparents who are storytellers. So they share their stories and we involve them with their skills. And these kind of activities we designed in the program. So I think it's very important. Thank you so much for both of those comments. And, and it's so important to look outside of the, the norm, so to speak, when you're talking about getting people on board. And to know people really want to change hands. Sukraj, do you have a, right. another question? Yeah. yeah. Can you repeat your last line? Because I think your internet got stuck and we couldn't hear it. Or was it just how important it is to to not just network with people above you, but people who want to make change happen? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, and I think my kind of one of the last questions that have been coming up again and again, because in the last two, three months, given the research and given the conversations we've been having with our innovators, our founder, um, Sakut Womanen, as well as Pasi Salberg, who's a Finnish education researcher, they collectively have come up with 10 steps for leadership during a crisis. And maybe we can put the link in the uh, chat box. But I, my question to both of you as leaders for your organization would be is uh, what were or what do you think should be the first steps to take when experiencing like a major shift in the in the market, like whatever that community or the work that you do? Um, when there's a shift happening and you can sense it coming, like the pandemic, uh, what are the first steps to keep in mind as leaders of organizations like yours? Um, I think uh, for, for me, one of the greatest things that I suggest to people to keep in mind um, is to both find the root of the problem as well as the root of the opportunity. Um, whenever there's a shift, um, there is a reason that shift is happening, whether that is COVID-19, um, whether that's political unrest in another case for a global voice for autism, um, but find out what that issue is, um, really understand how it's affecting the population you're aiming to serve, um, but then also find out what that core opportunity is. What, is a, what do you see as something that's about to shift, um, possibly irreversibly in society, and that you can jump on to get ahead of the curve and really create a solution that thinks beyond an emergency response. Um, and I would say um, that's my main piece of advice because in every challenge we faced, no matter how difficult it's been at the beginning, and they have been difficult, um, there have been huge opportunities that have come out of each and every one of them. I think this is the same answer that I want to say, say that this was a challenge, but it was an, also an opportunity to learn new uh, 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 thing and to see your programs in the new, uh, you can say, context that how you can shift this uh, already existing uh, your experience to the to the current situation. And for the team, I can say that it is not possible without having a good team. A good team means people who understand and who take this as an opportunity and who are flexible to work with you. So these are the these are th few things which are very important for uh, working on these uh, issues, especially when you have these kind of disasters. Absolutely, and I think this just what you said is kind of relevant, not just to pandemic, like physical disasters, political unrest, and that just kind of shows that a leadership needs to have a certain mindset to pivot and to continue to serve these stakeholders that you know each organization has uh, decided to. Um, that's all for me. Thank you so much for uh, answering my questions, our community questions as in when they came up. There are a bunch of other questions as well, but they're very specific to autism or your individual program. So we will encourage our audience to, um, we will send a follow-up email where you could add those questions, but also 
to follow both Melissa and Fakira on Twitter, ask those questions. Um, and with that, I will pass it on to Mariah to close off this wonderful webinar. Thank you again, Melissa and Fakira for answering thank my question. Yeah, thank you both. And if, if you would, if we could share your presentations, I think there's going to be a lot of people who would be really happy to, to receive them so that they can connect with you after this, this webinar. Um, I would like to end sort of with a question pushing, pushing towards the future. And uh, I would like to ask both of you, what is one thing that you hope for post, uh, post COVID that we can hope for education? I think that uh, the basic thing is that uh, the, the, we have to focus on the lesson learned and to see that uh, before that we were only working on innovation and new things. And whenever we were talking about innovation, we think that everything will be new. So innovation is not uh, everything new. You can do innovation with your traditional or your old medium also. also. The new thing is what you are doing. So this, uh, COVID has showed the major divide between haves and have not. And it is a lesson learned that whenever we design or whenever we plan something for the children, especially when we are talking about equity and um, uh, inclusiveness, then we have to see all, all available resources and opportunities and we have to work on that. And there is a need for collaborative efforts because alone we cannot do anything. Absolutely. Melissa? Uh, I'd also like to underscore Fakira's important point about collaborative efforts. Um, and then also to emphasize that I hope that the pandemic will lead us to rethink education in a way that is truly inclusive. Um, there is significant research that has shown that all students benefit from education that's inclusive. Um, but so often, inclusive education is tokenizing. It's viewed as putting somebody who is different from the majority of the class in that classroom space without truly supporting their development and success. And I hope we use this opportunity to think about how we can create inclusive educational opportunities that support the development and success of every learner um, in an environment where students can also learn from each other and benefit in that way. Thank you both for those comments and, and I could not agree more and I hope that as we move forward from this pandemic that we are able to take the lessons learned and take this as the opportunity it is to radically reimagine what our education systems can be. So we have a few minutes left if anybody has any last minute burning questions I know that there's a lot that went unanswered um, but we will share with you the recording, the slides, and uh, as well as other resources that were shared throughout this, this session. So I would just like to say thank you all so much for joining us today. Thank you, Fakira and Melissa, for, your, for the amazing work you do and for joining us today. And, um, and yeah. Left a tweet um, in the chat for all our audience who are still here. We do want to make noise for Melissa's work, for Kira's work, as well as all the other amazing Open Idea Challenge winners. So we have created a sample tweet. If in case you, if you um, liked what you heard in today's webinar and want to give them a shout out, please do share your thoughts on any social media channel. Tag us, tag our amazing innovators, as well as Open Idea. And yeah, thank you so much. With that, we will now close the webinar and hope to see you in the next one. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.